Today, you'll be watching the Foundations of Behavior, Part 1. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Charlene Ortiz, and today we are going to begin a new section of our literature, of our lecture content. And today we're going to start talking about the biological basis of behavior, the foundation of behavior. And you're thinking, well, this is a psychology course. What does that have to do with anything? Absolutely everything. Why is that? Because any factor in mental health, psychology, counseling, whatever term you want to think of, everything will have a biological foundation to it, whether it be genetics, functions of the brain, chemical imbalances, trauma, whether it be psychological or physical traumas, for example, a head injury. So notice that everything in mental health will always have a biological foundation. That's why it's so important for us to come to a basic understanding of the biological basis of behavior. Now keep in mind, it's only one section, right? There are people who dedicate their entire lives to understanding the biological basis of behavior sports, for example, neuropsychologists, neuroscientists, right? So their entire career is based on learning about biological basis of, of behavior. So keep in mind, this is very brief in terms of the breadth of the type of knowledge that we have to do, because as I mentioned, everything in mental health will have a biological foundation to it. So keep that in mind. We do offer biopsychology here as an entire course. And later on, for those of you who are interested in moving into the biological aspect of psychology, so for instance, neuropsychology, evolutionary psychology, things of that nature, that is a field of study in psychology. So let's get started. So one of the first things that we need to understand is that behavior requires the rapid processing of information. The fact that you are listening to me, whether in person or online, that required a very fast processing. How is it that we conduct this fast processing? One of the ways that we can relay that information is through neurons. What is a neuron? Very simply put, it's an individual cell in which we receive information. We integrate that information and we later transmit that information. And we will actually cover much in detail how that process looks like. Now, the neuron is composed by several different parts. The soma is one of the first parts that we're going to be discussing today. I want you to think about the soma as the body of that cell. In here, we will find the cell nucleus, and this is what is going to produce that chemical change, the chemical machinery, if you will, that we find in most cells. So notice that in a cell, we are dependent of that transmission. We're actually going to cover this a little bit more in detail later on. Now, something else that I like to mention, it's basically the end portion of that cell, of the neuron. And that would be the dendrites the end portion of that cell. What is dendrite? I want you to think about a tree, right? I want you to think about the branches of a tree. And that specific part, the dendrites, are specialized in order to receive that information. So when the cell receives that electrical chemical charge that comes from external stimuli. So for example, you being able to hear my voice, that required that that information was received by that dendrite 
and conducted that electrical chemical pulse in order to activate that neuron, engage in an actual potential that later is going to lead to a chemical response. Any questions so far? Fantastic. Now you're wondering what happens, what happens when this response is received? Well, then that response, that chemical and electrical charge is going to move towards the axon. And the axon is the long portion, that long portion of the cell. So we have our dendrites, we have our soma, that includes the nucleus. And then the axon is that long tail-like feature or part of that neuron. Basically the responsibility, the responsibility of that axon is to move that electrical charge, move that signal along the other neuron so that it can be connected to another muscle, for example, or glands. Any questions about that so far? All right, and you. Now, when it comes to other parts of that cell. Notice that here we have our axon. Right? But I also want you to notice this covering that that axon has. That covering is what we refer to the myelin sheath. So think about a wire, right? Think about any wire you've ever seen the electrical wire you've ever seen. And notice that that wire is protected by an insulating <laughs> covering. Listen, an insulating covering. That is what the myelin sheath is to the axon. It's simply a covering that encases and protects that cable, if you will, that axon, if you will. Now, it allows not only for insulation, it also allows that neuron to be stabilized, right? That signal to be stabilized. Now we're going to move towards another aspect of that cell, and that is the terminal button, terminal button. What is the terminal button? Well, once we're moving along the axon, we're going to start moving towards the end of this cell, the end of that long body, if you will. And the terminal button, it's simply a small knob that is at the end of that axon. And that is what is going to secrete the chemicals that we refer to as neurotransmitters. So if I pull this image up here, notice that once that signal moves along the axon, it's going to go to that terminal button. I'm going to zoom in the terminal button so you can see how that transmission happens, right? So that you can see how that terminal button is going to release that neurotransmitter, whatever it may be, in order to conduct yet another function. Any questions so far? This is what it will look like soon then. But we're going to talk about it a little bit more in detail. Now you're thinking, how are we doing this secretion, right? How are we moving that neurotransmitter to the next neuron? That gap in between them, that gap between one neuron to the next 
That is what we call the synapse. And that it's simply that space, that junction, if you will, where that information is going to be transmitted from the end of this neuron, right, the dendrites, and it's going to be transmitted, or terminal button, I should say, it's going to be transmitted to the next neuron. Any questions about that? Okay. So I want you to view this process as basically the communication that you would see, say, for example, in an electrical wire, communication that you would see in an Ethernet cable, right? It's a really good analogy to think about how this process goes by. Now, we do have a continuation for our nervous tissue. And this is where we have the glia cells. Now, glia cells, we can find it all throughout the nervous system. We can find them throughout the nervous system. So I don't want you to think it's simply localized to one area of the brain, for example. Notice that this type of cell is found throughout your entire nervous system. And their main function is to provide support for neurons. What do I mean by that? Well, like I mentioned earlier, the communication of behavior has to be very quick, immensely quick. Say, for example, this, this equipment that I have here is really hot, right? If I were to place my hand on this equipment and that communication is not sent from that external stimuli, which would be my hand, and it's sent through my nervous system to my brain, my brain would relay that information through neurons, passing through the dendrites, soma, axon, later to the terminal buttons, telling my brain, hey, that hurts. It sends another signal so that I can remove my hand because this equipment was hot. Because that communication has to occur so quickly, we do need supporting cells such as the glia. Now, that's not the only function that they serve. As you can see, they have multiple uses. So for example, it provides nourishment to the neurons. It also helps as a little cleaner because all of the, the waste products that that neuron may produce will be taken care of by that glia. It also assists on that insulation that we were mentioning earlier, creating that insulation. It can also work as a neuron, if you will, because it can send and receive chemical signals. And like I said, chemical signals are that method of communication for our nervous system, ergo, our behavior, what we see, right? And as you know, psychology is in the business of predicting behavior. Glia cells can also play a role in a variety of major disorders. So far, we are aware that dysfunctions in the glia cells can lead to the development of schizophrenia for example. So notice that they're not only worker bees for our neurons and serve multiple purposes, but an actual dysfunction with the glia cells can lead to some forms of mental illness. It's also related to issues with depression if there is a dysfunction with the glia cells. It's not the only thing, but issues with the glia cells can lead to depression. Any questions about glia cells? Fantastic. Right. Now, how exactly does a neuron communicate, right? Because I keep saying it works very similar to that of a cable, right? An electrical cable. It's actually pretty close in a very analogous way, let's say that. How do neurons communicate when it comes to activation? 
right? We know they communicate through chemicals. How exactly does that process begin? Well, it begins with a neural impulse. And I want you to think very similarly to an electrical shock. What we know is that that electrical signal is going to move across the body. It's going to move across the body of that neuron and it's going to activate it. What does it look like when it's not activated? Well, it looks like this. It looks like it has what we call a resting potential. A resting potential. What we are referring to a resting potential is that the neuron is stable. There is no electrical stimulation to it. Therefore, that process of going through the X and activating the dendrites, releasing neurotransmitters hasn't occurred because it is resting. And generally, this will be considered a negative charge, right? In millivolts. Now, this is only when the cell is inactive. But whenever we have a neural impulse, notice that we went from a resting potential, right? This resting potential here, as you can see. But then this neuron received a stimuli. So in keeping with my example of say, I put my hand on something hot and I reacted. So that temperature was the external stimuli. Now this, neuron is going to respond to it. So what's going to happen? Well, initially, we're going to receive that significant jump in regards to we went from a resting potential to an action potential. Later, we're going to go down way below that base. So this was the, see if I can do a better line than that. So we were in a resting potential. But notice that the refractory period goes beyond, you can see here, goes under that resting potential. And once that neuron has filled its purpose to release whichever neurotransmitters or conduct any movement that it had to, it's going to go down to that refractory period and it's going to go back afterwards to that resting potential. Any questions about the neural impulse or the resting potential? Good deal. So, as I mentioned, we have our action potential. What is that? That is this jolt here, that large peak stimuli. And it's going to be a very significantly brief shift in the electrical charge of that neuron. Say, very sudden, very immediate change in the electrical charge of that neuron. So if we go back, you'll see how by the leap by beautiful art. Notice that from a resting potential, Within milliseconds, we went from a resting potential to that action potential, that spike, if you will. Now, how does that operate? How does the action potential operate? The way it happens is we're going to have, we're going to have that electrical surge in that axon. Right, it's going to move across the body of that neuron. And what happens is when we have that sudden change of electricity, what's going to happen is that the membrane of that cell is going to open up. It's going to open up so we can let sodium in. And then that is going to close up once 
it has shut that action potential. Now let's talk about, or before I say that, are there any questions about the action potential? All right, so the action potential is that peak in electricity where we're going to open up our membrane and it's going to let in sodium. Generally it's a combination of sodium and potassium, potassium I should say. Once that happens, that will shut back up and not allow that sodium to come in because it has to prepare to that next stimuli, doesn't it? As I said, it has to be very quick. So we can leave those membranes, the openings of those membranes open, right? We can't leave them open. They shut very quickly so that it's ready for that next potential electrical surge that it may have. Now we spoke very briefly about the absolute refractory periods. What do I mean by that? That is this characteristic here. So notice that that refractory period, this would be my resting potential, right? This is when that cell is not being stimulated. But if you notice, there is a period in where our millivolts went under that resting potential right here. That is what we refer to the refractory period. It's that point where the cell has completed that potential. Now, during this time, when it's in that dip, if you will, that refractory period, nothing else can occur. There cannot be another action potential because that electrical charge has to be stabilized once again, meaning I cannot receive any other information that's going to be processed. This is immensely similar to the orgasmic period and time frame that males experience, right? So they will have that excitement. They will reach an absolute peak, which we could equate to an orgasm. And we can equate that here with a cell as the action potential. Then that refractory period in which no other stimuli will be able to affect our neuron is very similar to when a male has had an orgasm and there's a time in which the male will be physically unable to produce an orgasm again. Then that male will go back into that resting potential. And that is immensely similar to the process that a neuron has. Because during that time, just like a male wouldn't be able to have an orgasm, the neuron would be in the same fashion. It wouldn't be able to receive other stimuli that coincidentally would excite that neuron. Something that I need to mention is that neural responses are all or nothing, are all or nothing potentials. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that either the neuron is activated or it's not. Either it did receive that electrical charge or it did not. It will not fire, very similar to a firearm, right? pistol or rifle, either you pull the trigger or you did not pull the trigger, the trigger. That firearm would not shoot if there isn't enough energy being exerted on that trigger. In a similar fashion with neurons, that neuron will not fire towards that action potential if we don't have that trigger pull, if you will. It doesn't reach and excite that neuron, it simply will remain again in its resting potential. Any questions about the action potential or the refractory period? What happens if, like, say, a, like a negligent issue, talk about firearms, like, what happens if the neuron? Starts going off by itself. It's called seizure. Seizure. 
So we will have those electrical responses. And when the brain is overstimulated, you have a seizure, for example. But notice that it's still firing, like it's still occurring. So it's still an all or nothing response. Does that make sense? Good deal. Good. Right. Now here, I want you to think about that terminal button that I was mentioning, right? So the very end of that neuron. So imagine that my arm, right? My arm is the axon, and there we have the terminal buttons. So if we zoom in that terminal button, say for example, the tip of my finger, this is what it will look like, right? It will look like the end of that neuron. We have a synaptic cleft. This is that gap where one neuron and then the cell membrane of another neuron meet. This is where they will meet. Now, go ahead. The synapsis is that bottom dangerous. Right. So let me, yeah, I'll be artistic. Look at that for our friend here. What's your name again? I forget. Tyler. Tyler. For our friend Tyler, I'll be artistic today. So it would be this space. Okay. Like it. So let's think about before and after we are sending that signal. So notice that that signal was traveling down here, right? That electrical signal was traveling down that axon, and you can see it right here. This little arrow. Notice here, this is our terminal button, right? So imagine like the tip of my fingers. We have that space here, that synaptic cleft. And now, before, before that signal passes through the other neuron, which would be, now these would be the dendrites, right, of my other neuron. There we go, through a dendrite. Before it passes to the next one, that's what we call the presynaptic neuron. This is the neuron that is sending that signal. Let's see if I can make it a little bit more clear. Resynaptic neuron is that neuron that is sending down that action potential, that electricity. And as the term suggests, we have our postsynaptic neuron. That is this neuron here, right? That is receiving that electricity, right? So imagine two cables that are connecting. One cable is sending the electricity to the other cable. Now, it doesn't communicate strictly through electricity. So we have the synaptic vesicles, these little sacs, if you will, that will contain on the, in the inside, it's going to contain those neurotransmitters. Now, this would be a summary of that process. So if you're wondering, how is it that neurons communicate? How is it that I get my serotonin? How is it that I get all my neurons working? This is the process. So we have that action potential and it's going to, we're going to have that storage of neurotransmitters in the synaptic vesicle. So those little sacs are going to contain your neurotransmitter going to be activated by that voltage change, which in turn, going to release that neural transmitter. So notice that it's going to move it down, across that postsynaptic potential. Then it's going to start releasing my neural transmitter. 
I know it's a lot of little details to remember, but once you learn it, I can promise you, you will not forget it, <laughs> especially if you stay with it. Those receptor sites, when you take something that's like a neural inhibitor, is that what they're doing? Exactly right, right. So our friend here was mentioning, whenever we are taking certain medications, right, we have these little receptors here, right? You can see them here. Notice that they will fit perfectly, right? So for example, this one's round. So this would fit, and of course, this is for illustration purposes. I don't want you to think, oh, so this one is round, right? But notice that the neurotransmitter would fit perfectly within that post-synaptic membrane. And those that won't fit, won't bind. See, this one's like a diamond shape. So it won't bind to this one, but it will bind to this one here. And what our friend was mentioning is that some medications prohibit the reuptake of a neurotransmitter. So we're going to go through this process. We have that action potential, postsynaptic action potential. It's going to move my little vesicles. The vesicles are going to move towards the end of that terminal button. Once it moves towards the end, we're going to release that neurotransmitter. Once we release that neurotransmitter, it's going to bind almost like that toy that children have. It's a little box and then the cube fits in the square and the star fits in the hole that's a star. It's immensely similar to that, believe it or not. It will fit where it will fit and those who were not, those neurotransmitters that will not, that were not used, that will be step number four, which would be inactivation. Those that we didn't use, we are going to recycle. They're going to go back to that neuron. So if I didn't use these, they're going to be recycled by enzymes that are going to move them back into that neuron. And reuptake, as the term suggests, is when we take back those neurotransmitters that we did not use. We're moving them back to that presynaptic neuron. Any questions about these five steps? So we release, right? So we are releasing from that action potential. We are moving the vesicles. These vesicles go to the end, and they're going to be released into this postsynaptic neuron. They will only fit where they will fit, similar to that toddler's toy, where the star fits in the little hole. That's a star, cube, cube. Very similar to that. Once they find their slot, if you will, they are going to find. A neurotransmitter is going to bind towards that postsynaptic neuron. However, we don't need all of them. So what's going to happen is that those that were not utilized in the process, imagine for my engineers, I see you. Imagine a solar panel, that electricity that wasn't used can be recycled and stored in a battery, right? That's what this is. That neurotransmitter is going to be stored and recycled back into that neuron. Once it is back in, that's the process that we call a reuptake. Right? Because we don't want to waste that neurotransmitter. Any questions about that process? Yes, sir. So, two, maybe three questions. Um, first, how sort of Precise is that process? Like, how much excess of uh, neurotransmitter is used? Is it just like shoving like a ton of stuff and hoping it gets and then taking the extra, or is it like fairly close? It depends. So, the question was for those who couldn't hear is, is the process relatively accurate? Does it know how much it has to release, or does it just 
secrete many new neurotransmitters and then they get lost and now we have to reuptake. The question to that will depend if the person has chemical imbalance, right? So for example, a chemical imbalance based on drugs, a chemical imbalance based on alcohol, a chemical imbalance based on a psychological disorders. For example, the person has depression, right? So in keeping with that, as our friend mentioned, say for example, you're a person who has clinical depression, right? Depression is a chemical imbalance. It's a chemical imbalance. And what happens is we're not secreting enough. So the medication, what it's going to do, it's going to block that reuptake. It's not going to allow that recycle. Because we need to pump you with this as many as we can. Because either you're not receiving enough, or there might be a structural functioning at a molecular level. There could be a function issue, right? As I mentioned at the beginning of the class, anything psychological will have biological. So in this case, it could be it's not secreting enough, or say, for example, there's chemical imbalance that is stopping this binding to occur. So not only is it not binding, it may be recycling too much. So when we have an antidepressant that blocks that reuptake, now we have more. So sometimes it could be based on a chemical imbalance. So kind of similar to that. What happens to the ones that like are you so is it like only the ones that are used are recycled? Um, or are the ones that are actually you know, fitting to the slot when they can basically back up and sent back or the so, so it that? depends, it depends on the type of neurotransmitters. For example, if this involved a serotonin process and for some reason we started secreting another neurotransmitter, that would be recycled back. It would be taken back. For example, to that neuron that secreted that substance in the first place. So it would be recycled back. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. Uh, I mean, the final point is how long does that stage of the process take? Like, how long does bridging that gap? Absolutely nothing. Okay. This whole entire process, if I can give you an example, think about the last time you burn your hand, right? And you experience pain, right? So in the process that touch something, you burn your hand, moved your hand, that seems immediate, right? That whole process, you already are going to start secreting serotonin to deal with this pain that you're experiencing. So it's absolutely nothing. It's immensely short. Yes, ma'am. So when you're talking about like not secreting enough for like depression, would that seem to like manic depression or? Sometimes we secrete too much. Right? Sometimes we secrete too much to answer that question. So it could be not enough. We may be having an issue with binding. And if we're having an issue with binding and reuptake, now we just have too much going on. Right? Yes, sir. Um, I, could, I, I might be wrong here, but are, aren't there some disorders that cause proper serotonin? Improper what? I'm sorry? Aren't there some disorders from weird serotonin that don't affect you? That don't what? I'm that sorry. Don't just that don't just affect mood. Yeah. So, for example, some behaviors can change, right? Some behaviors, because remember, everything will have a biological foundation. So, his question was, if I got that correctly, not only mood, but if the secretion or the lack thereof of neurons, excuse me, neurotransmitter affect, say, for example, something else. So, for example, it could affect behavior, right? So, let's talk about when we are focusing, say for example, I have depression, which I may or may not have. Okay. Say I have depression. And my behaviors are going to start changing because of my serotonin. So say I start thinking, I have no friends. Nobody wants to hang out with me. I am so lonely. That could be a change of behavior because you would confront a client and say, okay, well, let's do some homework. I want you between this week and next week, I want you to record how many phone calls you had, how many text messages, how many Instagram, TikToks, whatever, how many times someone tried to contact you. And then you'll notice that your behavior has changed because you have refused to, not refuse, let's change that term. You have not understood that you yourself are changing your behavior and saying, I don't wanna hang out, I don't wanna hang out, I wanna stay home. But by the same token, you're saying, 
I'm, I'm alone, nobody wants to hang out with you. So your behavior did change because of the pressure. So not only it's mood, but it can also, your behavior can change and your perception, your memory can change. So notice that that neurotransmitter not only is going to have an effect on your mood, but it also has an issue with your behavior. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? And ask them. Right. Now, there are multiple aspects of that post synaptic, synaptic, I should say, relationship. We can have, as I mentioned, similar to that example of males whenever they are reaching climax and reach an orgasm. We also have the excitatory period. It's a postsynaptic potential. It's a change in voltage in which we have a shift that increases the likelihood that that postsynaptic neuron will indeed fire that action potential. So imagine that potential here is, it's going to increase the chances that I'm going to fire an actual fire action potential. Now, by the same token, this could be an inhibitory process. So, contrary to this process, where we are increasing the chances, exciting that neuron, that postsynaptic potential, on the contrary, this process here will implicate that negative voltage shift, that contrary to our excitement previously that increased the likelihood an inhibitory process is going to decrease that likelihood that we're going to fire we're going to release those neurotransmitters and in keeping with our friend earlier this entire process occurs within milliseconds As I mentioned, we have the reuptake in which those neurotransmitters that were not used will be reabsorbed. Back again to that presynaptic membrane. So very similar to that solar panel that has all of that electricity, that that wasn't used is going to go back to that solar panel. All right, it's not going to go to waste. We can store it, for example, in a battery. So think about that battery as that little vesicle, that little sponge that's going to take back that neural transmitter. Any questions about that? Fantastic. Interestingly, I've only talked about one neuron interacting with a second neuron. But I need you to keep in mind that one neuron can receive thousands of signals at a time. In order to decide whether or not I'm going to fire, remember that action potential, in order I'm going to fire this action potential or not, I'm going to remain chill, you know, relaxing, watching Hulu, right? I'm not going to fire the section potential. It will include that excitement and that inhibition. Whether or not I am receiving that positive or negative charge, electrical charge, and that's what I'm going to use, that neuron's going to use to decide, if you will, whether or not to fire, whether or not to continue with that neural impulse. I do want you to keep in mind that neurons it's not one neuron with the other, right? Generally, it's immensely complex. There is a network. So I want you to think about a immensely complex spider web. Right? Think about a metro station, a train station, right? Those interconnections between bus lines or trains, 
I want you to imagine that that is how a neuron looks like, that network of neurons looks like. We have billions and billions and billions of neurons. Now, interestingly, we don't only depend on that action potential. We also depend on that pattern, right? That pattern also has to be accurate. So sure, we're thinking about the neuron and the neurotransmitter and how it affects your behavior, but it's not only that, right? Think about gas fires that bus, but the connecting buses, right? The network of buses, the bus routes also affect your trip. In a similar fashion, those pathways of that bus stop are very similar to the pathways that we will have in a neuron. And therefore, it's not only the gas, right? It's not only the action potential, that electricity, but also the connections and pathways will also have an impact on your behavior. It's interesting because we like to think about, oh, the more connections I have, the more X, Y, Z. It's usually the opposite how we prune, how we cut, how we eliminate old synapses tends to be a little bit more accurate in trying to understand whether or not that pathway is going to be beneficial or not, right? We like to think, oh, the more connections I have, the better it's going to be. And that could be a misunderstanding because most of the time, it's not about what we have, it's about what we're getting rid of, right? If this connection, if this Synapse is not providing a benefit, use it or lose it, right? So for example, in the case of Jeannie that we saw earlier in a previous lecture, unfortunately, because her connections weren't used earlier in life or language, she was unable to add parts of a sentence, right? So she would say, store, buy milk. She wouldn't be able to say, I want to buy store. I want to buy milk at the store. Right, because those synapses were lost. Right, they weren't excited when they were supposed to be excited at a young age. So very similarly, this has a bigger role. The elimination of those connections tends to play a larger role. Any questions about that? Fantastic, you guys are sweet. Now, these are our common neural transmitters. Now, the first one, we are aware that specific neural transmitters can serve a specific function. And as our friend was mentioning here, what's your name again, ma'am? Alice. So as Dr. Alice was saying earlier, right? We may have too much or too little, and that could lead to, for example, other mental illnesses. Now, the first one that I like to talk about is acetylcholine. 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 Interestingly, we're not, this specific neurotransmitter is not necessarily located just in your brain, we will be able to find it throughout our nervous system and also your voluntary muscles. All right, so we're going to find it throughout voluntary muscles. What does that mean? Me doing this, this was voluntary. I am, I am intending to punch my fist, right? So notice that in order for me to do that, there was a communication of my will, and those who are, you who are in philosophy, you know, is there such things as free will that my body tell me to move, my brain tell me, right? It's a whole thing about that. But notice that here we have that neurotransmitter that is affecting the voluntary movement of my muscles found throughout your nervous system. Now, the next aspect that I want to talk about is monoamine. And this is a family that includes three neural transmitters. 
And I'm sure some of you have heard about these before. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Now, firstly, let's talk about dopamine. Generally, dopamine is abbreviated as DA, also known as district attorney. If you know that, I hope you're not in trouble. <laughs> district attorney. Dopamine controls a lot of our voluntary movements. Interestingly, too little can cause Parkinson's disease little of dopamine can cause Parkinson's disease. Now, another thing that I like to mention is norepinephrine. And in the case of norepinephrine, we find that people who have depression, who have depression, Share the screen really quickly. There we go. So we are in oral right here. They tend to have lower levels of activation for norepinephrine. And I'm talking about the synapse level, right? They have less activation when it comes to that synapse potential, right? Not the all or nothing potential. I'm talking about the synapse potential. Now let's think about serotonin. Serotonin has an awful lot to do with the regulation of sleep and the regulation of arousal. Now we know that issues with serotonin, we know that issues with serotonin with the circuits, more specifically with the circuits, circuits I should say, of serotonin are significantly related to anorexia. Now, something interesting about dopamine is that we have an ongoing hypothesis when it comes to dopamine. Now, we mentioned that too little can cause Parkinson's, and we have a hypothesis that too much can lead to the development of schizophrenia. Now, again, this is considered a hypothesis because schizophrenia has many layers, right? There is a genetic component to, schi to schizophrenia. There's many other significant factors, but one of them is our hypothesis that it could lead dopamine, increasing dopamine could lead to schizophrenia. Basically what occurs is that there are there's basically overactivity of dopamine in certain areas of your brain, which could lead to schizophrenia. But again, that's our understanding. It's still a hypothesis. Yes, sir. So what we're thinking, we will talk about SSRIs later. I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be today. Leave at 11, right? Okay. It's not going to be today, but we will cover them. Any more questions? But I don't want you to think that I'm, you know, we'll talk about that. Now, interestingly, what happens with, say, alterations? When I mean alterations to this family, I mean, for example, taking drugs. That is an alteration of your chemical balance in your brain. So think about when we are thinking about abuse, drugs, for example, cocaine. 
don't do cocaine. Don't do cocaine. We're thinking about cocaine. We're thinking about amphetamines. Don't do amphetamines, kids. This is because they produce that same rewarding effect that comes from your free neurotransmitters. So what happens is we are replacing or overexciting, if you will, this family, and we are exciting it with, for example, another upper, so cocaine and amphetamines, which is why these drugs are so highly craved because they produce that effect long-term. Yes, ma'am. So marijuana, essentially what it is. I, I couldn't hear him, I'm so sorry. Um, would marijuana have the same effect? Um, now, with, with marijuana, um, not necessarily here, not with specifically with the, let's say, that reward. There is a, there is a psychological component actually to marijuana. It's the, uh, as we know, marijuana is not addictive, it doesn't have an addictive component to it, but the behavior of smoking Marijuana is addictive. Does that make sense? So it is, it provides that reward, right? Whether it be because it provides a sense of relaxation, it provides a sense of community, it provides a sense of, of say, for example, hanging out, right? So notice that the actual chemical per se is not addicting, addicting, I should say, but the behavior could be, right? It's where it's like, think about, think about gambling. There's no chemical in gambling, right? But the behavior that we're getting from gambling, that excitement that we're getting from gambling is the other. Does that make sense? Answer your question. Any more questions? Can you say that there's a number of behaviors that the behavior itself could be addictive? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sex. Sex is one. Stealing. So, right? Getting that high of, a, ooh, I'm gonna get caught, right? I'm gonna run from the police, or, and you'll see that the person is not struggling financially, or they don't have a, a need, they're not a no. So we're replacing, we're looking for that high, right? That stimulation. So, absolutely. I would argue any behavior can be addicting if you try hard on it. Don't do it, kids. Don't do it. Any more questions? All right. Now, we're going to talk about GABA. And GABA is another group of neurotransmitters. Now, it is an amino acid. And GABA stands for gamma amino butyric acid. I'll say that again. Ready? Say that five times real fast, right? Gamma amino butyric acid. Gamma amino butyric acid. I say that five times real fast, right? Now, interestingly, we were talking about how we can excite a neuron and how we can inhibit a neuron. GABA is the only one that provides that inhibitory postsynaptic potential. This one is actually going to reduce the chances of that action potential, postsynaptic action potential into occurring. Now, interestingly, GABA is closely related to anxiety. It regulates anxiety in the sense that if we have a disturbance in these circuits, we can later find a contribution to anxiety disorders. And that is closely related, I would argue, to the behavior, right? So for example, I usually don't ask people to read in class. Um, I try not to read from the slides either. I like to elaborate, of course, in, in the topic or give you real life examples. But say if I were to ask someone, hey, can you read the slide? You know, some people don't care. They're like, sure, I'll read 10 slides. Right? And some people would have to prep into reading a slide. So if I start here and I have everybody read a slide, they're like, oh, it's my turn's coming, my turn's coming. 
So there's no inhibition, right? I would argue that some level of stress is necessary, right? Like we need that level of stress. If I say, hey, you have a research paper due tomorrow, for instance, you need that level of stress that will light a fire and say, oh man, I need to get to reading, to writing, maybe meet with someone, meet with a TA, meet with Dr. Shar, right? But then that stress becomes distress. Now it's not regulated and that's what leads to anxiety. Right? So level of stress is actually beneficial. Problem is if it's chronic or if it's intense and it's not inhibited, if you will. So that's why we relate GABA to Potential. A lack of GABA. Right. Because think about now I don't have something that is stopping me from this regulation. Now all of these are firing. And now I'm not having that form of regulation. Imagine if you top that with you don't know how to cope. So now we have a chemical component because I don't know how to cope with this. So maybe if I drink, you know, a couple of white cloth or something like that, I'm going to feel better. Okay. So now we have two problems. Yes, sir. That also relates to ADHD. So interestingly, who can tell me, just out of curiosity, who can tell me about ADHD? What does that occur in our brain? It at the brain level. What exactly is going on? Is our brain turned off or is our brain turned on? Who can tell me? Yes, ma'am. When you say turn off, what do you mean? Or turn off, I couldn't hear you. It's like you're turned on, but it's a matter of not. So you think that ADHD comes from the brain just, just on all the time? Yes. Okay. How many people agree with her? Show of hands. ADHD is basically your brain is just going to town, right? How many of you think that ADHD happens because there's some shutdown somewhere? Okay, so majority. That's actually correct. It's basically there's not a shutdown that needs to occur in order for that person to be stabilized. So what we do, we activate that. We activate that process, right? So that's why medication for ADHD are generally stimulants because we need to turn that on. We need to control that inhibition. All right. Any more questions? Yes, sir. That in its own. Like, is there a case where ADHD will just kind of go away as the brain kind of? Well, something to think itself? about. So, our friend here was mentioning can it go away? Can it just by itself? Remember that if I have a, for example, if I have a chemical imbalance, right? Uh, for example, I have ADHD, I have depression, schizophrenia. Generally, chemical imbalances are chronic, which means they're long term. And usually the combination, and of course I'm not a physician, right? So I can't prescribe or anything like that. The general rule of thumb, however, is it will be long-term and it would require resetting that or stabilizing those chemical imbalances, whether because you have too much or not getting enough. So it generally tends to be chronic. Not only that, it will affect other functions, right? Because now say, for example, the structure of the brain will change because of that chemical imbalance. So, so even if you did something and like kind of get it, it won't like stay doing it or work, hey, I need to actually produce this stuff. Is that is that anything you could do to kind of teach it how to do it? You could with therapy. I'm not saying with therapy you're going to change your chemical balances because I have will be beyond my scope and the scope of, of science really. But you would eventually, it's it's a tough decision because most people don't like taking medication, but I'm going to show you an illustration. So it's change like the environment you live in, or like just like a lot of those lines, like surrounding factors. They have a mild case of ADHD. That will help you significantly. That will help you significantly in learning how to cope because chemicals, see, medications are going to treat the symptom, right? Therapy treats the chronic aspect of it. So for example, I like to equate it. I might've given that example before, but I'm not sure. I want you to think right now that you have an immense fever, 
I mean, if you have an immense week, don't show up to class. Just go on YouTube. Don't do it. I don't want your Rona. You don't want my Rona. Just don't do it. But let's assume for a second that you have a significant fever and you go to the ER. The first thing they're going to do is stabilize this fever. And then they're going to deal with the cost, for example, an infection. Maybe you cut it, you step on a nail, you didn't even notice it, now you have an infection. That's why you have fever. Psychiatry deals with that fever. Medication will deal with the symptom, which would be the fever, right? So in this case, hyperactivity, things of that nature. Therapy would deal with that infection. It would deal with changing patterns, organization, accountability, journaling, scheduling, things that you can do for ADHD. So notice that one doesn't replace the other. They're complementary. And a lot of people think, well, if I go to therapy, it's going to take care of the symptoms. Well, it's going to reduce the symptoms, right? Hopefully significantly to where you can lead uh, a life based on well-being. But notice that one treats the symptoms and the other one treats the more chronic aspect of things. And when I say chronic, I don't mean serious. I mean long-term. That's what I mean by chronic. A lot of people hear chronic, they go, oh, it's serious. It's like, no, it means long-term. That's what chronic means, at least in my field. Any more questions? So that illustration that I wanted to show you, I want to see if I can find a good picture, right? I'm not able. I'm not able. This one could be good. So in this case, if you notice, let me share the screen so people at home can see it. Okay. Let's see. So notice our control subject, right? Brain is activated, you know, the higher, the redder the color, the more activation we have. And notice that with the ADHD subject, that inhibition is low. It's basically a shutdown, as I like to call it. So you're given a stimulant, something to activate your brain so that this region then becomes more active and look more closely to control. Now notice that the medication that with symptom, which is was inactive or make it inactive. So that way it can basically perform or have the same baseline, if you will. Now this is only going to take care of the symptom, right? But if the person has poor scheduling, missing appointments, can't concentrate, has issues sitting down for a test, you know, once we control the symptom, we can deal with an infection, which is, okay, let's deal with it. We need to work on your scheduling, having an accountability body, having a good, uh, having apps that can help you regulate. If there is an additional stressor, going to therapy, because if you're worried about your parents, you might not be worried about that exam that you have to take before not study. So notice that therapy will help you then in the more chronic side of things. Any more questions? All right, let's see, let's see. Where was I, where was I? All right, let's talk about endorphins. Let's do that. Let's talk about endorphins. All right. Now, interestingly, endorphins are very similar to opiates, which is why people who become addicted to opiates are looking for that natural common effect, which in this case is the modulation of pain, right? So think about insane aspects of people who every now and then you'll see you know, scrolling on your phone or on the news or your parents told you there was this lady who picked up a car because her kid was stuck under the tire. Every now and then you hear something really crazy like that. Or, hey, this guy fought off a bear to uh, grab his dog, right? So every now and then you hear these crazy cases of someone who had that superhuman strength, if you will. And you notice that during that time, they didn't feel pain. If you asked them, did it hurt to pick up that car? Did it hurt to fight off that mountain lion or that bear? They will tell you no. Matter of fact, I didn't feel it till a couple hours later. Why? Right? That's because we have endorphins that deal with the regulation of pain, and it will reduce the chances of us experiencing pain. Interestingly, endorphins also deal with the regulation of eating behavior. Right? So we have an awful lot to do with eating behavior, 
in our response to stress. So, and we will cover that much more in detail when we're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system and the autotomic automatic nervous system. When we're talking about that, you'll know how exactly that process works. For example, somebody gets shot and, or police officer, they're responding and there was a shootout. And then you notice that the guy was shot in the shoulder and he doesn't even realize it until somebody points it out to him like, hey, you're bleeding, right? That is because of a combination between endorphins and adrenaline. So it is responsible for pain. If you are experiencing pain, you can respond to that stressor, right? So if I am responding to something like that, um, for example, I get hurt for some reason, or that police officer gets hurt, they are responding to a stressor, which is a shooting. I wouldn't be able to respond to that stressor if my pain is not being modulated somehow. And that's where endorphins will come in. 